Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are uh, discussing diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so uh, we've discussed the structure of the eye, we've discussed what you see if you look for an ophthalmoscope, we've discussed the structure of the retina. The one last little thing we need to discuss before actually moving on to the pathology of diabetic retinopathy is we need to discuss um, the microvasculature basically. Okay, so we need to discuss arterioles, capillaries, and venules, and what the structure of each of those is. Okay, microvasculature. Right, so this just means small blood vessels, basically. Right, so basically, this is the principle. What happens is you start off with small blood vessels known as arterioles, okay? And there is a little bit of a problem here. Basically, arterioles, the term arteriole actually covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels, okay? Um, to specify that you mean an arteriole just before, basically, it branches into capillaries, you can put uh, the word terminal arteriole, okay? So, we're talking about very small arterioles, arterioles that are... Um, you know, they're about to branch into capillaries. So a terminal arteriole will then branch into capillaries. So I'll just show three of these, but in reality you'll have many, many of these capillaries, which are even tinier little blood vessels, a single cell thick, basically. Okay, so a single red blood cell can fit down the lumen of a capillary, and then the capillaries reconverge to make a small blood vessel known as a venule. Now again, the term venule covers a very broad scope of different sized blood vessels. To, so to emphasize you mean the venule just after capillaries have reconverged, you can put post-capillary venule. Okay, so we mean a venule just after the capillaries, so this is a post-capillary venule. Okay, and these in the middle, these are capillaries. Okay, right, so we have a terminal arteriole splitting into capillaries. The capillaries then reconverge to form a post-capillary venule. Okay, so let's look at the structure of these different types of blood vessels so that we can uh, understand what changes are going to occur in diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so we'll start off with a terminal arteriole. So basically, terminal arterioles have two major layers. Okay, so you have endothelial cells, which I'll show like this. Okay, so you have a ring of endothelial cells, which will line the lumen of a terminal arteriole. And the lumen will not be massive. It's bigger than the lumen of a capillary. You can certainly fit slightly more than one red blood cell down the middle of it, but you can't uh, fit a huge number of red blood cells down the middle of this. So it is a very small blood vessel. Okay, so here we have the endothelial cells, so I'll give them nuclei, okay? And basically these endothelial cells will be sitting on a basement membrane. So I'll now colour in the basement membrane in turquoise. Okay, so here we go, here is the basement membrane in turquoise, okay? And the basement membrane is a membrane of protein, basically. It consists mainly of the protein collagen, okay? But it also has other proteins within it, such as laminins and um, fibrillin is also another important component of the basement membrane. Okay, and this basically gives structural support to the endothelial cells, okay? So um, the endothelial cells, you know, they're just gloop, basically. What is holding them, you know, in this shape, it's because they're attached to a very rigid structure, and that rigid structure is the basement membrane. Okay, right. Uh, so, I'll label up the endothelial cells as well. This is not the full structure of an arteriole yet. Uh, we're going to add another important layer, and ECs is just short for endothelial cells. I suppose I should write the full name at least once. So, this is endo filial cells. Okay, and then surrounding the basement membrane, what you then have is a layer of smooth muscle cells, okay? Now, it's not just necessarily one smooth muscle cell thick, it might have multiple layers of smooth muscle cells, but it is a single layer of smooth muscle cells. Okay, so let's have these smooth muscle cells here. So I'm starting to regret already having drawn the smooth muscle cells one by one. Um, 
here are the smooth muscle cells basically they will surround it like so and as I say you can have multiple layers on top so it's not necessarily one layer okay like so and you can imagine continuing it on like so so it completely surrounds uh, the terminal arteriole so that's the structure of an arteriole now let's turn our attention to the structure of a capillary capillaries are tiny basically they have a circumference which can be spanned by a single endothelial cell basically like so so you can have a single endothelial cell going the full way around okay and then they will, again will have a basement membrane around them like so and they also have other types of cells that surround them okay they have a special little type of cell known as a pericyte which has contractile properties but they sort of are dotted around you don't have a continuous layer of them they're just sort of dotted they kind of are like starfish sort of dotted on the capillary okay so this is a pericyte here and I'll color it in a special color to distinguish it from the endothelial cell so we'll have the pericyte in blue okay so capillaries have these pericytes that surround them uh, and have contractile properties now you can see that the lumen of a capillary is absolutely tiny okay so uh, a single red blood cell can pretty much fit through that lumen so it's a very very small blood vessel Right, so we'll now turn our attention to the post-capillary venules. And I would just like to say one more thing about capillaries before we move on. Capillaries are where, um, you know, they're often referred to as the business end of the microvasculature. And the reason for that is that they are where the exchange of nutrients and waste products is actually going to occur. So nutrients will leave the blood and go into the tissue fluid and waste products such as carbon dioxide and water will come back from uh, the um, uh, tissue fluid and come into the blood basically. Okay, so capillaries are where exchange occurs. And then finally we'll talk about what a post-capillary venule looks like. And I think I might have found quicker way of drawing it now. If I just do that, then yes, this seems much less effort. Okay, so post-capillary venules, they're really just big capillaries, okay, so uh, they have a, more endothelial cells than uh, capillaries. They take need more endothelial cells to make up the complete circumference than do capillaries, uh, but their wall is pretty much the same sort of structure as for capillaries, i.e. it generally just consists of the endothelial cells with a basement membrane around them, and that's all you have to get past if you want to move across this wall, okay? Uh, so they're really just like big capillaries, okay? So this is a post-capillary venule. So that's our discussion of the microvasculature now uh, complete. So let's talk about the pathology of diabetic uh, retinopathy. Okay, so uh, diabetes is persistent chronic hyperglycemia. Okay, so if you have diabetes, you will have frequent periods where your blood sugar is too high. And when you have too high blood sugar, that's called hyperglycemia. Now, hyperglycemia through mechanisms that are still not understood, but it has been shown, basically. We don't understand the mechanisms, but we do know hyperglycemia causes diabetic retinopathy. Okay, by mechanisms that, as I say, are not understood, it causes diabetic retinopathy. Now, basically, there are two phases to diabetic retinopathy. So hyperglycemia is going to cause the first phase, and then the second phase is going to be caused by the first phase, basically. So the first phase of diabetic retinopathy is what's known as the pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Okay. So what happens in pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Well, many different things happen to the microvasculature within the retina, basically. Okay, so uh, the first thing to say is uh, that the pericytes, basically, uh, in uh, the um, capillaries, the pericytes that surround the capillaries, those go down in number. Okay, so I'll just list what happens. And as I say, the mechanisms by which this happens are not known. So one of the things it causes 
is the pericyte number goes down. So you lose the pericytes surrounding your capillaries. Okay, so pericytes go down. I'll just put an S there. Right, so no more pericytes around those capillaries. In addition, the basement membranes become much thicker. So basement membranes become thicker. So I think I'll combine these together to make a little picture out of this. So I'll now draw a capillary that has a much thicker basement membrane, but with no capillaries. And it's not just in capillaries that the basement membranes get thicker. It's in all of the microvasculature, but I can kill two birds with one stone if I draw a capillary. Okay, so here is our endothelial cell that's spanning the full circumference of our capillary, like so, there's its nucleus, and now it's going to have a really, really thick uh, basement membrane, basically, so let me now show this. Okay, um, like so, so here's the basement membrane that is really, really thick. Okay, so we have hugely thickened basement membranes. Okay, so I've combined those two into a picture. So basement membranes go up, pericytes go down. Okay, right. Uh, now, also what happens is you get a lot of what are known as microaneurysms. Okay, so a scary word. Uh, so let me explain what an aneurysm is, because there are many different types of aneurysms. There are true aneurysms, and there are false aneurysms, and people often talk about dissections, although they're not strictly an aneurysm, but they can lead to aneurysms. So I'll talk about true aneurysms, false aneurysms, and dissections. Okay, so um, what is an aneurysm then? An aneurysm is basically where you have an abnormal dilatation of an artery, basically. It's usually an artery, but it can be a blood vessel, any old blood vessel. Okay, so usually, basically, if we just draw a blood vessel, and usually the typical examples of aneurysms do not involve arterioles. Instead, you know you're talking about aortic aneurysms. So we'll use the example of the aorta. Okay, so we have some massive great blood vessel here. And, you know, it's supposed to be a certain thickness. Now, basically, an aneurysm is when it hugely dilates at some point. And this isn't just, you know, it isn't just the sort of natural physiological dilatation that you get occasionally. Um, it, this is a massive great ballooning out. Okay, so I don't really know how I'm going to show this picture because I've drawn it too big. Let me draw another picture. Okay, and this time I'll be able to show it more effectively. So if I draw it more like this, I'll be able to show the ballooning much more effectively. So instead, if instead you have something that looks like this, okay, and I want to stress, it's the ballooning of the entire wall. So the entire wall is stretched out, okay, like so. So if you've got your massive great ballooning like this, or this really obviously pathological dilatation like this, this is known as an aneurysm. And this is what's known as a true aneurysm, what I've shown you here. Okay, there is also false aneurysms, things that can look like huge dilatations, but they're not actually dilatations. So let me now talk to you about what a false aneurysm is. So basically, a false aneurysm isn't actually an aneurysm at all. It's a, um, it's a hematoma, basically. So what's a hematoma? Well, basically, what will happen is you'll get some sort of damage to the vessel wall, which will actually mean that there is a great big hole in the side of the vessel wall. Okay, so you've had some horrendous damage to your blood vessel, and you've now got a great big hole in the side of your wall. Now, basically, Blood vessels are surrounded by connective tissue, okay? Extravascular connective tissue. And this is the important thing. This is a difference between a false aneurysm and a dissection, okay? So this is not connective tissue that is part of the vessel wall. It's not tunica intima. It's not tunica media. It's not tunica adventitia, okay? It's beyond the blood vessel, okay? So you've got connective tissue outside of the blood vessel, and often this will form, you know, sheets around the blood vessel. So as soon as you have this hole, what starts happening is blood starts pouring in, and it sort of, you know, it forces the connective tissue out as much as possible and creates this huge, great balloon here that is full of blood. Okay, like so. And the center of this balloon where the blood is, is continuous then with the vascular lumen here. 
Okay, so this then is what would be called a false aneurysm. And false aneurysms are also sometimes called pseudo aneurysms. So a false aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm, whichever term you prefer. Okay, so basically this looks like a normal aneurysm because you've got this massive great dilatation where well, you've got a massive great swelling but the blood vessel isn't actually dilatated it's just that you've got a hole and basically it's um, filled up a cavity that exists between the blood vessel wall and this extravascular connective tissue here and you've basically now got this pulsating um, mass of blood Okay, and I'm about to write extracellular there, uh, extravascular connective tissue. Okay, and basically when you've got a mass of blood, that's what's known as a hematoma. Okay, so oma means tumor, uh, and when it's a tumor of blood, basically, it's a hematoma. Okay, and often hematoma is spelt with the American spelling, uh, the American spelling of um, heme, so hematoma. Okay, right. Uh, so false aneurysms are not actually aneurysms, they're hematomas. Um, okay, right. Now let's also talk about what dissections are, just so that we're clear on that. They're not important for us. We're talking about aneurysms, true aneurysms, okay, which you see in the microvasculature. That's what's weird. You get dilatation of the microvasculature blood vessels. These are usually pathologies that we think of as occurring in, you know, massive great arteries. Okay. Okay, so what is dissection then? Basically, dissection is when you get some sort of injury to the vascular wall, but not as bad an injury as you had here, not one that completely puts a hole in the vascular wall. Instead, what you get is one that puts a partial hole in the vascular wall. Okay, so maybe a little hole like this, but not one that completely goes through the vascular wall. Then what happens is blood goes into this and basically it can force its way between the uh, potential planes, between layers of the blood vessel. So maybe in the case here, you could split uh, the basement membrane away from the smooth muscle cells and the blood would move between uh, the um, basement membrane and the smooth muscle cells. So basically what you'd end up with is a layer of blood between two different layers of the um, blood vessel wall basically and that then is known is what's known as dissection because dissection means separating uh, pieces apart basically so you're separating uh, different layers of the blood vessel wall basically okay so that's what is meant by dissection so basically you get huge unnatural dilatations of microvasculature blood vessels uh, in the uh, retina uh, in response to hyperglycemia Okay, so we'll continue this discussion of uh, the pathology of diabetic retinopathy in the next video.